was a great interpretation of Tracy Westerman, but I'm really apologise, Barry. Um, it's really important for Welcome to Country to um, honour people who come from different country. And uh, I'd now like to um, welcome the 2018 West Australian of the Year, Dr Tracy Westerman. Dr Tracy Westerman is a proud Nyama woman from the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Tracy holds a postgraduate diploma in psychology, a master's degree in clinical psychology and a doctor for philosophy, clinical psychology. She is a recognised world leader in Aboriginal mental health, cultural competency and suicide prevention, achieving national and international recognition for her work. Thank you so much, um, Carol, and thank you um, for inviting me here to talk today. I'm not too sure about Barry saying he's better looking than me, but we'll leave that to the audience for your objective appraisal on that particular issue. Um, I'd like, obviously like to begin by thanking you all for coming today. I'm, I, know, I know you're actually doing pretty well when the size of the audience actually dwarfs the size of your hometown, and that's by, <laughs> that's by a country mile. I'm from the Pilbara, so this is clearly a bigger audience than, than exists in the Pilbara. Obviously, when I was made the West Australian of the Year, I guess my challenge was to invite these really difficult conversations into the lounge rooms of the average Australian. I guess for some of you, um, you've been personally affected by suicide directly, so I'd obviously like to acknowledge that also. We have the highest rates of um, child suicide in the world in our Indigenous communities, and what I've said many, many, many times is that when this occurs, this is no longer an Indigenous issue. This is an issue that affects us all as Australians because our community is clearly only as strong as our most vulnerable. These are Australia's children, and so thank you so much for feeling so personally affected by this, because obviously change occurs when a, lot of, when a whole community actually says that change needs to happen. So thank you so much. Obviously, I'd also like to acknowledge those of us who have been bereaved by suicide. For the past two decades, I have walked this journey with you, and I'm so in awe and humbled by your strengths and resilience. It's just an incredible thing to actually see, to hold you through pain and to also see that you have this unbelievable desire to make sure that the services that weren't accessible to you are accessible to people who are clearly struggling with the grip of mental illness in their families. So I thank you so much. Obviously, what I'd like to do to begin with is acknowledge I'm standing on Wajap Nyungar country today as a young kid that came down from the pool with a dream that seemed completely impossible at the time, and that was to become a psychologist. Wajap Nyungar people have been incredibly um, supportive of me, and I want to acknowledge Wajap Nyungar people for that very reason. I guess the thing I really love these days is that through the power of optimism, we're actually acknowledging emerging leaders. This is a thing I guess that we know, is that there are a lot of Indigenous families and communities that are doing extremely well. 80% of Indigenous families are actually doing extremely well. Last year we had six Indigenous people graduate with medical degrees. More recently, I actually um, had five Indigenous psychologists that became recipients, inaugural recipients of the Dr Tracy Westerman Aboriginal Psychology Scholarship Program. So I ask you, why isn't that the story? The power of optimism is an incredible thing, and I'll talk to you about the power of optimism and, and the difference that it's made in my life as well shortly. However, Martin Seligman, who's Mr Happy Psychologist, actually tells us that if we teach people optimism in middle grade, we can actually eliminate 50% of depression. I'm actually interested in that kid that comes from the Kimberley that's exposed to suicide and doesn't become at risk of suicide. That actually tells us a hell of a lot more about prevention than just focusing on risk alone. I'm actually interested in those communities that don't have high rates of suicide, of which we do not talk about, and of which there are actually many. Without optimism for the future, we run the risk of suicide and mental ill health becoming normalised in our Indigenous communities, a self-fulfilling prophecy for those who need to believe in the possibility of change. And I hope you'll join me on this whole journey around optimism, because optimism is important. Optimism saves lives. OK. I just want to talk about my, I guess, my own journey with optimism that started, I guess, as a kid from the Pilbara. To make things really simple with this presentation, I'm just going to hit up two things for you today. I'm actually going to talk about what I see as the six core drivers um, of the escalation of Indigenous suicides. So I just want to really focus on that in terms of what we know can actually make a marked difference. The stakes are too high for ambiguity. We need to be really, really clear here about works about what works and where the gaps clearly are so that we can actually focus a sustained effort on ensuring those gaps don't continue for future generations. Okay, this is my own story of optimism. 
as a 15-year-old kid growing up in the remote Pilbara town of Tom Price, I had to do um, distance, edu distance education or school of the year to get into university. I picked up a book as a 15-year-old and decided right there and then that I was going to become a psychologist. <laughs> it's fair to say the odds were reasonably stacked against me, having <laughs> never met a psychologist in my entire life. Um, I've got no answer for it other than the fact that I thought that sounds like a pretty good idea and let's do that. Um, to make things even more fun, again, both sides of my family, mum and dad, had never gone past three, year three in education. No one in my family on either side had ever seen the inside of a university, so the odds were reasonably stacked against me. So optimism is clearly something that I'm so grateful for in terms of what my parents provided me with. Here's um, my mum's certificate of citizenship. So in 1964, my mum, as an Aboriginal woman, had to go to Port Hedland Court and get citizenship of her own country. To have that citizenship, she had to demonstrate three things, and that is that she could speak English. The second thing she had to demonstrate was that she had severed ties with all other natives, which was her own family, so the rejection of her own family in terms of culture. And the third thing she had to demonstrate was that she was free of disease. So actually, the true heroes of this story are my parents, because in one generation, and despite all of it, they've managed to raise a daughter that has a PhD in clinical psychology and was recently named your West Australian, Australian of the Year. So you can close a gap in one generation. Okay, this is where I'm from, for those of you who don't know the Pilbara area. Some people sort of think you've dropped, <laughs> dropped off the planet when you say you're from the Pilbara, so I'll just actually do a map so you know where it is. <laughs> There it is. So my traditional people are called Yamul. Now there are two temperatures, of course, in the Pilbara region, which is hot and very hot. Okay, so <laughs> cold is not a comfort zone for me, as you can probably see. Um, grew up in a very remote um, area, and I guess for me, what I've actually learned, what opt optimism has actually learnt, uh, taught me, is in fact my early advantage, disadvantage has actually been my advantage. The things that are invisible to others actually aren't invisible to me, and that is such a gift that I didn't actually realise what a gift it was until I started to work in the most vulnerable communities in Australia. Because when people speak to me, the first thing I think about is females, the next thing I think about is Indigenous people, the next thing I think about is rural and remote people. So for me, it may just be people who are struggling with voices around them of lowered expectations that I want to actually represent to people that actually anything is possible if you believe in yourself strongly enough. When I was got into the University of Western Australia, came down with lots and lots and lots of excitement about this concept of becoming a psychologist. And I guess for me, the optimism that I was actually lucky with in terms of my parents and what they actually developed within me came in handy. <laughs> and that was because despite the fact that we had escalating rates of suicide beyond what, um, what we were seeing in the mainstream, we are certainly having suicide rates that were escalating despite um, the sorts of concerns that people were having in communities, that the training didn't match the statistics. And what that meant was my people were invisible. We we're invisible in the textbooks, we we're invisible in the training provided to practitioners. Psychologists and mental health professionals do not have any training around cultural competency. They are then dropped into the Kimberley, they're dropped into the Pilbara and expected to understand the complexity of suicide and then throw culture into the mix. And it becomes, I guess, th the skill base of very few practitioners in this country. After about three years, I thought if I ever see another university again, it'd be too soon. <laughs> I questioned whether I could actually be a psychologist. I was sent out to the Western Desert, and that was actually the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, went into the absolute coalface of back then, um, very, very high rates of solvent abuse. About 30% of the community literally would be walking around with tins of petrol and paint around their neck. That was literally their day to day. We had very little understanding back then of the impacts of solvent abuse. We didn't really understand the impacts on executive functioning. We didn't understand the long-term impacts of, um, of the, the, the issues that it does around psychosis and so forth. I remember one day I had a light bulb moment. I came into my, I don't want to call it an office, it was really a shed, let's face it, my office, um, and there were seven kids. And these kids were ranging in age, they're all siblings, range, range in age from four years of age all the way through to 15. And they were all high on substances. Thank God for my optimism, because the pessimist would have said, how on earth are we going to stop this? The optimist in me went, interesting, these kids are learning by group. This is what we know. Aboriginal people learn collaboratively, we learn by group. This is also what we know. You can have a lot of genetic predisposition for lots of things in terms of mental ill health, genetics and biology contributes. However, environment can literally turn genes on or off. Think of it this way, genetics load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. If you can change an environment, you can change an outcome. So from that day, and I actually asked those kids, 
little four-year-old, I said, how did you learn how to do that? Oh, because it's actually a really complicated thing to know how to do, is to learn how to sniff. My six-year-old brother taught me, and it went up the line. From that moment on, I knew that we, if we skilled up whole communities, that became our best opportunity of prevention from that very, from, from that very way forward. There's a lot of really smart people that are called cognitive psychologists and they actually look at how the brain develops, right? And they actually confirm that. Two psychologists called Piaget and Vyotsky actually said that you can only become so smart by yourself. The group that enables you to become smarter, obviously, by osmosis, right? Piaget also says that non-Indigenous people learn mostly individualistically um, up until, collaboratively, up until about nine years of age, and then they start to learn individualistically from that way forward. For Aboriginal people, we learn collaboratively from the moment we're born to the moment we die. Everything is about the group. Everything is about community. So you either give someone a fish or you teach them how to fish. You teach one person in an Aboriginal community, they tell someone else, who tell someone else, who tell someone else. Change is incredible to watch. The strength of Aboriginal people is extraordinary. 40,000 years, we are the oldest living culture in the world. Unfortunately, it, it's a culture that very few very few Australians will ever have exposure to. What we know is that 9% of non-Indigenous Australians regularly socialise with Aboriginal people. What we also know is 30% of depression in Indigenous people alone is accounted for by racism. 50% of chronic stress is also accounted for by racism. So we'll talk about those sorts of things, but in the spirit of continuing along this road of optimism, I guess. After about... Um, 10, 10 years or so of working through the Western Desert, I became quite frustrated, to be honest, about the lack of evidence-based um, training and, and provided to non-Indigenous practitioners and Indigenous practitioners alike. So in 1998, full of optimism, I actually started my own business, Indigenous Psychological Services, in a complete absence of government funding. To this day, we have still yet, yet to attract a cent of government funding, and most of our work is actually done, 30% of our work is actually done for free or no cost into the most chronically impacted communities in Australia. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unpack the sorts of work that we've actually done and why I've had to take, I guess, a very unique approach to trying to address and stem the flow of Indigenous suicides. How it actually started, it was quite high risk, to be honest. Back in 1998, people were getting really, really big on this concept of early intervention and prevention. And it was actually having a really marked impact in non-Indigenous communities. So what they were finding was, of course, non-Indigenous Australia has a reasonably high rate of suicide. The difference was is that the government actually stepped back and said, what are the causal pathways here? Why is it that people are actually choosing the option of suicide? And what they found, which is really important, is that 80% of people who die by suicide actually have a psychiatric diagnosis of depression. Pretty useful information to have, right? That's a causal pathway. A causal pathway means if you eliminate a cause, you eliminate the end result, which is the suicide. So that's why it's really crucial. The next thing that the government did was they said, okay, what we need to do is we need to arm a whole workforce around treatments of best practice, which are cognitive behavioural therapies. So, with those sorts of initiatives, what actually happened was lots of suicides were being eliminated. And in fact, in mainstream, what happened was the suicide rates were going backwards in some age groups, and they were actually plateauing mostly across the age groups. Interesting enough, Indigenous people were being excluded from those really important early intervention and prevention programs, and it came down to something this simple, that people didn't know how to assess for suicide risk. So I decided that I was going to go and self-fund the world's first um, screening tool for Indigenous youth at risk, the Western of an Aboriginal Symptom Checklist for Youth. It was really high risk. It was high risk because I had a hunch that maybe the risk factors were different. <laughs> it, couldn't, it might not have come off, but I thought it was probably worth checking. <laughs> right, probably worth checking. What we did was we found that the suicides were actually very different. There's a different nature to it. If you get the risk factors wrong, you get treatment wrong, you can't prevent. So that's why it was so crucial. So I'm a big believer in developing things from the ground up. Once you actually determine there are different risk factors, you can then design different programs around reduction of risk factors and ultimately reduce suicides at a whole of community level. Hopefully this is making sense for you guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. So in terms of optimism, how about let's prevent the gap rather than close the gap? How about that as an idea, which I kind of like? So let's actually look at the state of play. Sorry there's so many words here, but obviously suicide is multidimensional and multifaceted. We know that. Um, I guess I've been working in this field for a good couple of decades, and the things that actually are risk factors for one person will be different for the next person. There, by the grace of God, go I, in terms of I've never had someone that I've worked with die by suicide. What it comes down to is as simple as this. It comes down to assessment. All roads lead to assessment. 
So we need to get that absolutely right. We have, we have a culture of pessimism when it comes to Indigenous people. There is a self-fulfilling prophecy that's at play across, across every single major area of government, so everyone clearly has a role in this. OK, the statistics, 40% of child deaths are by suicide in Indigenous communities. I guess the, the difference is with Indigenous communities is that the age in which people are dying by suicide, it, it's quite young. The average age for a non-Indigenous person is about 42 years. For Indigenous people, it's about 24 or thereabouts. Um, but 40% of Indigenous children who die in this country, Indigenous children who die in this country do so by suicide. What we know is that people now expect it. People now expect it. So there's some really interesting preventative programs that can be run, obviously, in communities that enable people to develop the skills that we know, reduce the likelihood of them becoming suicidal in the future. Those programs are not available in our highest risk communities. So the frustration, obviously, is around that, that we're simply not doing suicide prevention. There's this saying in communities that people say it comes in threes. No matter where I go across Australia, they say it comes in threes. And if some of you were nodding already, there's an expectation that there'll be three deaths. So people are actually almost expecting it around the creation of risk, and that's what we know. Environment, remember, is a good predictor. If you have a mum who's depressed, for example, you're up to three times as likely to be depressed yourself. If you have trauma in your family, that actually gets passed down to future generations. You model environments that are threat-filled, and you model environments that can be um, negative in terms of how, um, how, how you actually pass it on to future generations. This is what we know. The Canadian Aboriginal people um, did something really clever. They had suicide rates that were reasonably high, sort of comparable to Indigenous Australians, but they did something clever. They actually got the suicide death data right. And I hate using those, that term because these are lives that we're talking about. But what they did was they found that 90% of the deaths are actually occurring in only 10% of the communities. Pretty useful information to have. What then happened, what that then means, you can mobilise all of your best practice programs into those highest risk communities. And surprise, surprise, they are our most remote communities. As we know, the Kimberley's up here, the rest of the country's down there. It makes sense to me that every single best practice program is mobilised in the Kimberley region to ensure that we have the best opportunity for suicide prevention. So what that enables us to do in terms of the Canadian experience is it also makes the problem more solvable. OK? So people will say things like suicides are everywhere. No, they're not. They're actually not. There's lots of Indigenous communities that don't have high rates of suicide. For those communities that do, they carry the burden for the rest of Australia. And we need to be really clear about our language, because if we normalise suicide, we can inadvertently create suicide risk in terms of Indigenous people. Mental health? We don't know. We're the only Indigenous culture, country, first world Indigenous country in the world, that doesn't have prevalence rates. We don't know how much depression there is. We don't know how much trauma there is. If depression is the journey to suicide, obviously we're much better off getting out the depression first, preventing that, so we don't have future suicides. It makes sense, but we actually don't have it. Child protection, as you guys know, 54% of Indigenous, 54 of kids in care are Indigenous. Doesn't tell me very much. Statistics tell you certain things until they don't. What we do know is that 100% of kids in care um, sorry, kids in care in the Kimberley, 100% of them are Indigenous. So we have the highest rates of child suicide in the world, and we have 100% of kids in the Kimberley who are Indigenous. It doesn't take much to draw a direct correlation between that. So when children are removed, those families never recover, those children never recover. And what happens with attachment and trauma, you pass it down. So we need to have programs in there that actually address disrupted attachment, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Interesting enough, 83% of treatment programs are based in the city. Education. Um, I want to just cup, head up a few things because I'm going to run out of time the way I'm going. Um, there's a couple of things in terms of Aboriginal kids, the longer we start school, the worse we do, <laughs> okay? which is not what you want. There's a couple of really simple things in terms of if the education department just made a couple of changes to these issues, you would virtually take over the world. Well, not quite, but let's start with Perth. Let's start with Perth for now. Aboriginal English, um, people used to call it broken English, but it's actually a recognised dialect. I'll do, I'll do a bit of Aboriginal English for you so you know what I'm talking about. Hey, you might be a bit silly way, eh? That's Aboriginal English, right? You like that? OK. So then I flick back into my normal standard Australian English. OK, so Aboriginal English is that. Um, interestingly enough, people call it broken English, which is not good, because as some, some of you may actually be linguists in the room, what you know is that how numeracy and literacy develops at a faster rate. You validate the primary language and you teach them the standard Australian equivalent. What's actually happening with Aboriginal kids is their language development is being dismissed and the science of numeracy and literacy development is not being 
um, applied when it comes to numeracy and literacy development. As we know, educational outcomes have a huge impact on suicide rates. Only 10% of Indigenous kids complete Year 12. If you complete Year 12, 40% increase in employment opportunities. Okay. Justice, I want to talk about, because we've just had some interesting research come out from the ABS that's actually shown us that that's a big predictor in terms of criminality, because it obviously affects future employment opportunities, those sorts of things. It's quite interesting, in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, we had 14% um, um, incarceration, went out 27%. We like locking people up. It's a deficit approach, it's not a justice reinvestment approach. We like building prisons, and as they say, if you build it, they will come particularly if you force them to come. OK, so what the research tells us, people think that there is a criminality, an increase in criminality, but there actually isn't. The research doesn't support that. It's about the increased harshness of the judicial process, so we're less likely to get bench warrants. An Aboriginal person charged with the same crime as a non-Aboriginal person is significantly more likely to get a custodial sentence, significantly more likely to spend time in prison. This is what the research tells us. What actually happens then is criminality becomes normalised. So, the biggest predictor of future criminality is the normalisation of criminality. I come from the Pilbara. <laughs> There's a little place called Roban. I love when people say, are you from Roborn? I go, is that, <laughs> is that near Roban? <laughs> Apparently it's very close. <laughs> Roban um, has its own maximum security prison. Come on. I think we should build a university at Roban and see what happens. So the criminality element becomes normalised because people don't have a sense of what they've done or feel a sense of shame or feel a sense of motivation to do something different. Most importantly, it becomes very easy to spend, put someone into robe and prison. It just becomes very, very easy. Um, most important thing, though, is the thing around under-policing. So there's been a 148% increase in the incarceration of Indigenous women. So basically what that means is that 90% of those women are victims of domestic violence. 80% of them are mothers. So not hard to draw a direct correlation. What's happening is some of these poor women, the police aren't coming. They've taken the law into their own hands, so then they're being over-policed and locked up for, you know, for a long time for doing things that, again, most people probably wouldn't be locked up for. OK. Let's actually understand, driver number one is you know, we need to understand that Indigenous suicide is different. So some common examples, an Aboriginal girl experiences spiritual visits of her friend who's passed away from suicide. The visits from her friend are telling her she should join her as in suicide. So, as you can see, the average clinician is going to struggle significantly with something like that. You can actually do the clinically right thing and the culturally wrong thing actually at the same time, but often people don't know the difference between the two. It's actually a very normal part of our grief process that we have spiritual visits. So you need to treat it culturally in order for the visits to then, interestingly enough, the visits are still there, but they don't, are no longer troubling to the individual. So you can clinically rate it, you can clinically monitor it, but you need to culturally treat it. Really, really complicated for people who don't know what they're doing, and particularly people that don't have training in this. Aboriginal male has a history of suicidal behaviours. He's actually a law man, L-O-R-E, been through a rite of passage. He only speaks bits and pieces of English. He's made a recent suicide attempt. The community says it's because he fell in love with somebody who was the wrong way for him. You try, and unma you try and unpack that as an average clinician. Suicide risk factors are also different, which I'm going to talk about in a second. If we understand risk factors, we can prevent, which is really, really crucial. There's also an individual versus community context to risk that doesn't exist in non-Indigenous communities, OK? Are you doing the clinically or culturally right thing? Driver two, we are actually yet to determine Indigenous suicide causal pathways. I've done a, few, a bit of writing recently. <laughs> recently on the issue around understanding suicide risk factors and causes of suicide. And it's a really important distinction to make, and even a lot of psychologists don't really understand the difference, but it's so crucial to this whole issue. So I want to speak to you about this and what it means for us. OK, so these are headlines that, in terms of the presentation of Indigenous suicide. Now, the reason why I started writing opinion pieces was because I work with bereaved families. I've had bereavement in my family myself around suicides. The stuff that's actually presented in terms of the expl explanation of Indigenous suicides is not based in fact. It's not based in fact. It's unhelpful, unkind, and it creates a lack of empathy for bereaved Aboriginal parents. So what actually happens is risk factors are confused for causes. So for example, alcohol, people talk about that as being, that is a risk factor. So if you eliminate alcohol, it's not going to eliminate suicides. Unfortunately, 
governments will think it's actually a cause. So what they'll do is they'll have alcohol restrictions and they'll say that's going to eliminate the suicides. And in fact, what actually happens is it gets replaced by something else. It gets replaced by a known causal pathway to suicide and that is helplessness and hopelessness. And that means that the things that are available and accessible to me as an Australian are not available to, to, to others. So you have a sense of the fact that you matter less. So that's what happens when your human rights are taken away from you. What we know, for example, the Northern Territory intervention um, that was based on the idea that there's all this rampant sexual abuse everywhere, which hasn't actually, as we know, come out in terms of reality, there's actually been a 160% increase in suicides. So this is the impact that it actually has when people have an absence of human rights. It creates a lack of empathy for Aboriginal people bereaved, but bereaved by suicide unwittingly. So what actually happens is, I guess I've said this many times, is that for non-Indigenous people who die by suicide, we rightly, rightly look to problems in our system, problems in us as a society. What, I'm, what I get so distressed about is when an Indigenous person dies by suicide, we look for deficits in, ha in our families and in our culture as explanatory of. It's the sexual abuse, it's this, it's all those sorts of things. The knock-on effect to that is we are ac actually confusing causes with risk factors. Hopefully that makes sense to people. Okay, so we need to change the narrative <laughs> of how suicides are presented because what happens is there's a lack of empathy in terms of bereaved Aboriginal parents. I've worked with enough in bereaved Aboriginal parents to know that none of them fit that stereotype. More importantly, however, how about if we control the narrative, which would be even better. Suicides need to be reported in the media. They just need to be reported in a way that's actually factual, that actually explains to people what the causal pathways to suicide actually are. OK, so these are the causes. This is what we know. I'll get through this reasonably quickly. Sorry about all these words. Um, I guess what we know is that life expectancy and infant mortality, um, Aboriginal people are considered to have, um, they're called fourth world conditions, and that means that we live in a first world country but we have third world conditions. So they've actually invented a new name <laughs> to describe it, which is actually um, the reality of what we're dealing with. So people are exposed to more death, negative life circumstances than the average Australian. Of course, like my mum, excluded from education and employment until the 1970s. I'm very lucky, I'm in third generation workforce participation. For a lot of Indigenous people, it might be the first or second. It's exactly like when women first came into the workforce. It's going to take a couple of generations for us to have parity to us to compete at an equal level. And some of us, quite a few of us, are actually behind already. Of course, what we know is that the assimilation policy and forceful removal has huge impacts. A guy called John Bowlby in 1951 first started talking about this concept of attachment to parents and he actually says that if you lose a primary attachment figure, i.e. mum, dad, he says it's impossible to bounce back from it. So what that then means is you pass that down to the next generation. Critical to a child's development is secure attachment to parents. That's how you develop a sense of yourself as loved and lovable, okay? And then what happens is if your environment actually tells you that you're loved and lovable, you develop these amazing things called self-soothing strategies, okay? And then you develop secure attachment. People that are securely attached have this amazing ability to step outside of emotion, to access the higher level thinking part of their brain, to effectively communicate their emotions to others and not overreact, okay? It's quite interesting that most of our suicides, 60% of our suicides in Indigenous communities are accounted for by impulsivity, and they're often in relation to intimate relationship breakdown. See how important this is to understand risk factors? Then what we can do is we can focus in on the things that we know are really effective in relation to fixing attachment disorders and impulse, um, impulse um, lack of tolerance around impulse, impulsivity. Trauma feeds trauma, that's what we know. If you have a trauma as a kid, you're significantly more likely to have a trauma as an adult. That's just the way, it, that's just the way life works out, unfortunately. It's called repetition compulsion. You are hardwired to think of the world in a certain way. Good example I give people is, imagine someone that's exposed to a lot of violence, and violence has become normalised for them. What actually happens with those people, interestingly enough, is that they actually find violence to be normal in terms of they can tolerate it. What they fail to tolerate is when things are calm. Okay, so the emotion that they struggle with is the tolerance for calm. So what you do, neuroplasticity is a fantastic new emerging field that tells us that it takes a thousand repetitions for a new behaviour to get ingrained. So if you have someone who can't tolerate things being calm, you keep practising it, practising it, practising, inject self-soothing strategies until it becomes normalised within them. Okay, that's just, um, just a really simple example of how we can actually fix these things. So you teach people tolerance for the emotions that they do not tolerate. A great story um, 
that I would love to tell is there's this man that I worked with recently who, probably one of the most incredible men I've ever worked with that had a child who died by suicide and he had some pretty horrific abuse in his background and he was told, I was doing a presentation in a remote community for about two hours and he was waiting around for ages to talk to me. You know, people just wait around, you know, they've got something in their mind. And he said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, what's going on? And he just burst into tears. And he said, I was doing a presentation on, on abuse, and he said, that stuff you're talking about, that actually happened to me. And I said, what's going on? He said, I, I can't hug my children. I just can't. What actually happens with people who can't tolerate love, love is they can't tolerate the love for self because it, they get almost like a sick visceral reaction in their stomach, actually, and they push people away. So they can't hug their children. They can't receive love. That's just the way it goes. He then said to me that, um, I said, why can't you hug them? And he said, because I was told that because I was abused, I'd become an abuser. There is absolutely no evidence to support, the, to support the abused abuser model. If that was the case, then more women would be abusers than men, and that's not the case. But there's no support for that in the literature. Spoke to him about that, and I said, when was the last time you hugged your daughter? And he said, I can't do that. <laughs> I said, right, where does, she, where does she work? Let's go. We're going to hug her. <laughs> the hugging van is turning up. So off we went in the car, and there she was walking down the street, and I said, is that her? She goes, yep. Yeah. <laughs> off we go. <laughs> Get out, hug her. Now, the hug was pathetic. It was like this. <laughs> this was the hug. This was the hug. I said, that, do it again. Seriously, come on. OK, this is what neuroplasticity tells us, right? Repetition, 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 until a new behaviour gets ingrained. So for him, he couldn't tolerate love. So what that meant was, five seconds, and I made him count in his head one cat and dog, two cat and dog, three cat and dog, and then let go. Next day, 10 seconds. Next day, 15 seconds. Next day, 20 seconds. Where you get people is that they pass that down to their children. And he said to me, I can fix this in myself. Absolutely, you can. Absolutely. Unfortunately, there are no Indigenous-specific attachment-based programs, despite the fact that globally, all these things are having a marked impact on traumatised people in terms of the um, not passing that down to their future, future generations. What we have instead is a constant restriction of human rights, so cashless welfare cards, in response to um, victims talking about abuse and alcohol reforms and, of course, the good old Northern Territory intervention. I just want to put this up here quickly because I'm just going to—I'm probably going to run out of time at some point. Um, we, this is, this is what we know in terms of the racism and how it impacts. It's quite interesting to me, and no surprise, that they're now actually incorporating racism within the sequelae. Just want to get that word out there, sequelae, of post-traumatic stress disorder, which makes sense to me actually because. I mean, people know about the flight or fight response, it gets, activa it gets activated, so your brain tells you that something's threatening, and the flight or fight response gets activated so that everything goes to the parts of the body that needs to in order for you to fight, i.e. defend yourself or run away. So there's a physiological reaction that happens from your brain telling you that threat's imminent. So, personally, as a very fair-skinned Aboriginal person, I don't like meeting new people, particularly if they don't know me, they don't know I'm Indigenous, because I can't cope with waiting for the racist comment to hit. So that makes sense. The flight of virus makes absolute sense to me that, that racism impacts on Indigenous people the same way as trauma, and that's what we know. The research actually supports that. So that's all the research there that we see. One of the ones that I do want to actually point out is um, it reduces life expectancy more than smoking does. The good news is that people that perpetuate the racism have outcomes that are just as, just as bad. <laughs> that's the good news. <laughs> OK, that's the good news. So um, Yin Paradis, who's an epidemiologist, indigenous epidemiologist, says it's the equivalent of smoking two packets of cigarettes a day, right? Being a racist, which is really interesting. It doesn't surprise me at all. Someone said to me the other day, what happens if you're a racist plus you smoke <laughs> two packets of cigarettes a day? I think we all know the answer for that, yeah? OK, so hopelessness and helplessness, as we know, is a strong predictor of suicide, just generally, right? So race, racism becomes hopelessness and helplessness, and it becomes reinforced on a regular basis. Things that are available to others aren't available to me, so that's kind of what happens. So it's a combination thing that's quite interesting. Um, th it, it shows up around about five to seven years of age. People with way too much time in their hands put probes on people's brains, yeah? And the amygdala, which is the emotional part of your brain, actually reacts to something that you find distressing. And what they've found, that it tends to really, really peak around about five to seven years of age, and then it sort of peters out a little bit. But obviously exposing children to diversity is critical to this whole thing. Just put this up there, because I love this. Children aren't born with racism. Racism is actually unnatural, and the science tells us that, which I absolutely love. 
I do a lot of work around developing cultural competency in people, and it's really hardcore and it's high risk. What it involves, it involves people recognising unconscious racism. But you need to do so in a way that evokes behavioural change. OK, and I'll speak to you about how we do that in a second. It is the most important work that I do. The less racist people become, the less racist society becomes. Driver three, we have a prevention allergy <laughs> and a deficit love affair, OK, which is what we know. Some of you may have actually seen this model. Effectively, what scientists have said for pretty much a long time is that if you have eight different ideas, eight different strategies around suicide prevention, you'll ultimately have a best chance of actually reducing suicides. In terms of what we're seeing in Indigenous communities, we simply aren't making sure people aren't stepping back and doing due diligence around what capability there is around the two pointy ones, which are selected intervention and indicated intervention. Just to make this real simple, selected intervention would be the things you do after someone is exposed to known risk. So for example, if someone's exposed to suicide death, we need to go in there and see what impact that exposure actually has had on them and do different types of prevention strategies to make sure that they don't then become at risk themselves. Indicated intervention is going in when someone is actually at known risk of suicide and actually doing specific things that we know um, reduce suicide. So where are we at with prevention efforts? Well, there's basically, despite it all, there are no nationally accepted evidence-based programs across the whole spectrum of early intervention and prevention. So that means suicide, that means attachment, that means trauma reduction. It also means criminogenics. OK, criminogenics is we're interested in what separates Aboriginal person A that becomes involved in the justice system from person B who doesn't. OK, we need to know that. We don't know that at the moment. I think it's also about impulsivity, to be honest. I think most of our crimes are impulsive, um, and we see that. You know, we actually do see that. Lack of funding due diligence. Suicide risk factor reduction, surprisingly, shockingly, is actually not a funding, required funding outcome. It's also not part of the closing the gaps tar gap targets. You can't close a gap if you're not measuring a gap. Programs cannot be developed and outcome evaluated based on risk reduction. Protective factors are pretty important, OK? So what we know, risk is only half the story, at least. Racism, for example, is a risk factor. You can't eliminate racism, right? What you can do instead is you can build up people's resilience and capacity to cope with racism when it hits. There's some risk factors that can't be altered. There's actually a dose-responsive nature of suicide risk, which is why we need to have all of these bits, because if we just encourage the talking, 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 without the targeted intervention, selected intervention strategies to follow them, then what we can do is we can inadvertently normalise suicide as an idea, and that's sort of how it works. OK, guys, just some solutions, because I want to try and end with a little bit of positive stuff um, in the spirit of being optimistic. OK, so assessment is critical. Risk of its nature changes. Being able to assess it and monitor it requires clinical instincts and then cultural instincts thrown into the mix as well. Get assessment wrong, get treatment wrong. What we know is that most of the mainstream tools that are around are inherently biased. They have error. You like to get a misread based on cultural difference, which is really important. So what we did was we developed a bunch of our own from the ground up. It's not popular in science. People tend to like adapting existing scales. But <laughs> I thought if we... Look, if we start from the ground up, if there are no differences, at least we know. If there are some differences, it's probably worth understanding what those differences are. But it was pretty high risk. I remember taking out a $20,000 loan as a 27-year-old kid and actually funding the development of the Western and Aboriginal Symptom Checklist for Youth. So what we found, 64% of the variance of suicide risk is accounted for by impulsivity. All the mental illnesses also look different to mainstream, which is really important because if we can get people at an early stage, we can do a lot of preventative stuff, so it's so important. Most importantly, you can identify early stages of risk. I guess the most frustrating element of um, the recent coroner's inquiry for me, there's been a lot of frustrating elements, but we had 13 Indigenous, beautiful Indigenous kids die by suicide. Not one of those Indigenous kids had a mental health assessment. Not one of them. That's what the average Australian should rightly um, expect as a, as a basic service for your children. If your child is in distress, you should rightly expect that you can take them into a service and they can help you. I'll put it this way. Imagine having a child caught in the grip of mental illness and there are literally no services to help you. Imagine when you do find a service to help, the cultural barriers between you are so great that any opportunities for healing are effectively lost. OK, so what happened, I guess, in 2004 is the Canadian government said, that's pretty cool, we need to do something exactly the same in Canada. 
um, unfortunately, um, there's been no uptake of the um, symptom checklist by government um, in Australia, but 25,000 clinicians have actually been accredited or chosen to be accredited throughout Australia. Unique test three is a really cool one, even if I say so myself. It basically, <laughs> self praise is no recommendation. Um, sometimes it's the only recommendation. A culture of stress um, scale for Aboriginal Australians, that's actually really neat because what it does is it looks at and engages the impacts of racism. It's also treatable, okay, which is really cool. The next one we've developed is the acculturation scale, very similar. What we know is that Aboriginal people who have a strong, robust sense of cultural identity have the lowest rates of suicide. This enables us to gauge which components of cultural identity are important and, dare I say, treat cultural identity, which sounds really strange, but that's kind of how we work, kind of how we go. Driver five, a lack of cultural competence in the existing workforce. What we know, no matter how many coroner's inquiries we've had, most of the children who die by suicide experience what they refer to as system failure. That means a lack of access to um, specialist services and programs, um, and it's consistent, consistent, consistent. So the answers are actually pretty straightforward, aren't they? You need to get all of your best practice programs into our most remote, high-risk communities. What we've done is we've developed world first um, capacity to, to, to measure and improve cultural companies across whole organisations. I've just developed one for the child protection workforce, which is a world first, and we've sampled 400 child protection workers. That enables us to understand the sorts of things that predict cultural competency. The idea being that is if we improve cultural competency, all those bits around the 54% of Aboriginal kids in care will actually reduce. If we can Im improve cultural competencies, hopefully the 27% incarceration rates can, can decrease as well. So that's the kind of big picture thinking around this sort of stuff. I'll just flick, flick through, sorry, I'm just conscious of time. Um, okay, driver six is the need to address whole of community risk. So what we've been doing for a long time is going out and skilling up whole communities. Makes sense, yeah? Skill up services, skill up youth, skill up community. However, people around the world globally say, you don't skill up community, you don't skill up youth. The research in the suicide space around this area is actually irrelevant because what we know is that the average non-Indigenous child isn't exposed to suicide to the extent that Aboriginal kids are. So you're actually leaving the exposed exposure um, without actually responding to the risk. So that's what we've done. We've trained over 1,500 people. Um, we have, it is the only program that's actually demonstrated suicide risk reduction in Australia. We're about to publish on that. People are interested in it. It's quite interesting, though, is you get the content right, but you also get the delivery right. So we do it in groups, remember? So group cohorts, so the skills actually remain in the community. People reinforce the skills. It's actually how you go about delivering it, which is so important. Um, recognition from USA, Canada and New Zealand, unfortunately unable to, be unable to deliver it in WA since 2009 because of the absence of funding. I was really privileged to deliver our programs um, in the last two days at uh, Mirabuka, which was just absolutely fantastic. Had about 10 bereaved Indigenous families in the group. Just such a powerful powerful um, workshop. Okay, so moving to best practice, introducing the um, Western Mandurya Institute for Indigenous Mental Health, which is just a, I'm just about to launch this, which is a not-profit, um, not-profit institute that aims to drive best practice nationally around all of those issues that I've just talked about. So if people are struggling on community, they can get on the blower, talk to us, and we can actually design, tell them what to do, how to evaluate it and actually capture all the data so we can cons consistently inform people on the sorts of things that are being effective and not effective, which is quite, quite cool. So there's four streams, as you can see there. Stream one, determine causal pathways and the extent of the problem. Stream two, determine treatments and best practice so people know what to do around depression, attachment disorders, a whole raft of things. Stream three is training high-risk regions and ongoing best practice program delivery. And stream four, which I will never stop being excited about, is the Dr Tracy Westerman Aboriginal Psychology Scholarship Program. Some of you in the audience know about this, um, but effectively I got quite frustrated with seeing another coroner's inquiry and seeing the constantness of the, of the conclusions, and that was that there was an absence of specialist services. I kind of went, well, I'm from the Pilbara. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the Pilbara when, and work in remote communities when I finished my degree, so it made sense that we'd actually target Indigenous people studying psychology from remote backgrounds, yeah? So I put $50,000 of my own money into it, $10,000 per annum for the first five years. We were then able to raise um, $360,000 in corporate donations. Um, so we were able to announce five recipients rather than one, which was probably the worst kept secret in the room, but that's okay. 
<laughs> which is just fantastic. Um, the other thing too, it's a program, which means that I'll personally mentor the recipients in best practice going forward. And of course, now what's happening in South Australia, Queensland, you're sort of going, we want to get us some of that. And I said, cool, that's great. Someone said to me the other day, I was interviewed by ABC Radio, and they said, what do you want, I'm sorry, New Art Radio. They said, what do you want to do with this scholarship? And I said, I want an army. <laughs> I want an army. Non-Indigenous and Indigenous, I don't really, I don't care if people want to go out and work in remote communities, obviously Indigenous are the, are the focus, but we need to play catch up. We're behind and we need to play catch up. So there's my kids. Um, the poor things are now being stalked on a regular basis by me. So um, they're all from remote backgrounds. Um, the beautiful girl on the right hand side is from Derby. To my knowledge, she'll be the first Indigenous psychologist from Derby, homegrown, and she's already up there working. So it's absolutely fantastic. Okay, last little thing, just a, a, a blatant grab for publicity, which is just, um, <laughs> just you have to do it when you're standing in front of people, is um, these wonderful people over in Sydney have decided that they're going to run a concert for life on World Suicide Prevention Day, and um, all proceeds go into the scholarship, which is just absolutely fantastic. So if you know anyone from Sydney, if you know rich people, that'd be even better. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's actually really cool. I need to brush up on my um, opera, which would be quite an interesting thing. So that's all the details there if people are interested in that. And thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. We have some time now for questions, and as you can see, we're heading close on time for this session to close. So if you've got some burning questions, can you raise your hand up so that we can get someone with roving mics to come to you? We've got one, two, three, four. Hands up. Five, six. That's, I think that's enough questions. <laughs> so we'll go with the lady here first. I need a mic. Come yep. in. <laughs> Tracy, can you hear me? <laughs> Tracy, <laughs> did the coroner speak with you about the recommendations? Because I was astounded that not one recommendation was about abuse prevention education. Yeah. You know, all of those recommendations, 42 recommendations, and not one about abuse prevention education. Mm, yeah. No consultation with you at all? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> that was an easy answer, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, hey, there's none. Which one? With the blue arm up? I mean, with the blue jacket sleeve. Morning. Um, I've lived and worked in the remote area of Midland for <laughs> a long time. I've been associated with a youth service which assists extremely disadvantaged young people, mm. about a third of whom are Indigenous. Mm. It provides a holistic service and a very continuous service of, in a family type arrangement. In spite of all our efforts, in the last 15 years we have had 30 of our young people suicide the bulk of them Indigenous, and I'm interested to hear what you think our service could do as well on top of what we already do. Yeah, and, and it's hard to know because I'd love to be able to get in and, and with your service. I actually worked in Midland as a young young psychologist. I love saying young these days. Um, the, I think the answer is that's why the Julia Institute is so important because people are doing the most incredible work with such a lack of resources but often they just need to be, that to be evaluated too. So what we'll do, for example, people ring me up all the time and they say, look, we've done this, and I go, well, what you need to do is you understand, is do this, 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 and this, or help them to evaluate the impact so they actually know what's being impactful and what's not, but also just skill them up in treatments of best practice. You know, So, so each, each region's different. Certain regions are doing things really well, but our, I think the job of this institute, hopefully it'll get up, is to identify the things where the gaps lie between targeted intervention and selected intervention sort of thing, so get more capability at that pointy end would be the b best way to go, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, yep. Down the back there, there was two. Okay. There, two, there's two, three there and one here and one, and De Dennis, you're last at the moment, at the moment. Yep. Sorry, Bella. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm embarrassed to say after working in the media, working in the Mental Health Commission for a short time and in government in senior roles, I have never heard of your work. Keeping to the theme of optimism, um, what would you like to shed or clear up with us? Why aren't you better known in government? Why isn't the general community more aware of the work that you're doing? Because I'm frankly astounded. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I guess when you've trained 25,000 people, that's a fair whack of people who have come along. And then keynotes on top of that, I'd, I'd say the reach has probably been 100,000. Um, I will actually say, though, I, spe I did spend 10 years in the Eastern States. I've only been back for three years. So that, that would be the nice answer. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think given that there's such a, such a lack of Indigenous people who, um, you know, have clinical expertise, and that's what we need, we need that clinical and cultural expertise at the same time, but it comes down to due diligence, you know. Google Aboriginal suicide and Tracy Westman pops up about number three, I think. <laughs> Potentially, <laughs> yeah. So it's about due diligence. It's about sort of saying, well, this is this is what the area we're doing really, really well, but what we're not doing well with the selected and targeted intervention is who's capable of that, and then do due diligence around that. Um, and there needs to be more people in government who have expertise in mental health. That's the biggest issue, I think, is that the people who are making the decisions don't necessarily need to be across it. That's my job, to be across it. However, the advisors have a responsibility to understand their portfolios really, really, really well. So I think that's probably the advice I'd give you. Thank you for the question. Um, to the side here, the lady on the couch. Yep. <laughs> Hi, Tracy. My name's Shannon. Hello. Um, I'm part of Break the Cycle here in Perth, and I've only been there for 20 weeks. And um, it was created because um, there was a lot of youth were taking their lives in the Māori culture yep. here in Perth. Yep. And there was no support services around that. And like it's impacted me heaps just seeing the power of the youth. Because, I mean, the youth outnumber the adults. We're just there to offer, cook their <laughs> dinner. Yeah. And they go off in their groups and teenagers, uh, women, or teenage girls and teenage boys. And then they have the little tamariki, the little ones. And, um, but these 13-year-old, 12-year-olds, yeah, uh, Lexus here is part of it, they learn to do the haka. Mm. They learn their cultural roots. Yep. I mean, a lot of them are born in Australia, so they don't have that support that they have in New Zealand. But um, that we really do. We're really quite strong around that. A lot of these youth, um, a lot of the members of their family have taken their lives. Yeah. And for me, I haven't had um, anyone take their life uh, in my family, but I've... I've um, had a lot of friends, and especially from the Pearl, because I lived in Karatha for about six years. Um, and I guess my question was, um, yeah, how do we get out there more? I see, see that strong impact that Break the Cycle is doing, and I can just see, it could be in every suburb, mm. you know, just supporting the youth, because that's yeah. who we need to support is the youth. Absolutely. I mean, the adults are already there. Question. Yeah. Yes. That's my question would be, how do we get more? Because we're in Balladura and we're opening up one up, um, in Allenbrook, but mm. we just need to get it out more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the cultural competency stuff. I mean, I've seen the most gifted clinicians paralysed in an Aboriginal community for the last 20 years. You'd see clinicians who you would send your family to, they're so gifted. You get them out in the Pilbara or the Kimberley. They're just paralysed because the exposure just isn't there and the training isn't there. I mean psychologists are trained in the scientist practitioner model so the science informs the practice if indigenous people aren't even in the training then you know even the basic constructs of being able to hear someone's story basic counseling micro skills some of the skills they teach you shut people down actually unwittingly because they don't work with indigenous people so you're trying to deliver things in a way that you're taught and it has no impact so the exposure just needs to be there from the start so the fear of working with Aboriginal people just isn't there anymore. <laughs> We've also started um, the part of Life as well, the Life. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe yeah. I'm part of Haka for Life and Corroboree for Life as well. Yep. And that's targeting men's suicide, suicide. Yeah. in, in um, Indigenous and yeah. Uh, yeah, both countries. Okay. And um, we did a three-week camp down at um, yeah. down south. And that, right. and that had a lot of Aboriginal pump people come and practice their culture yeah. and Amazing speak. Work. And that was all I could feel when I walked on that camp was love oh. and non-judgment. 
Yep. I think that's where it comes from, is love yeah. and non-judgment. Sorry, yeah, we've got a couple more questions. There's one here and one there. Yeah, that one. Yes. We'll see how fast your questions are, because <laughs> mindful of my timing. Yeah. Um, Dennis? Hi, Tracy. Um, Hi. My name is Dennis Simmons. I'm a young man from the southwest of Western Australia. Um, I have a background in psychology, but mm. predominantly it's working with young people and men in, in Aboriginal culture here in our country. One of the things that I see when we're engaged with um, clinical psychologists and our culture, mm. we tend to see the framework is around the clin psych, but it doesn't come towards the cultural side of things where we need it to be. Yeah, right. And we also see a lot of this funding going to um, major organisations with a non-Aboriginal framework and an Aboriginal person put in there yeah, to right. try to deliver, which is also a problem for us. Mm. One of the things I think is difficult that I'd like to be able to find a way to work towards is for us, Mark Hoodger, we do the cultural stuff on country down here, but we extend um, support and work with people in the Pilbara and in the Kimberleys because whilst it's difficult in the remote communities, I've, and I've delivered Aboriginal mental health up there for a number of years, but also here in Perth as well, we're not getting, even though there's more services here, it's not actually hitting the ground. Yeah, right. Exactly what you're talking about, because for us as Aboriginal people, we don't get to have the conversation, people like yourselves and other people that work mm. in the space, mm. we're not getting those conversations with government Absolutely. to be able to pinpoint where that funding is best put. Yeah, no, so I agree. I, it, I agree. it's the same yeah. for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And you're preaching to the converted. And just one really, really quick example of that is that suicide risk, right? People do it outside of the individual, so they sit there knowing what risk looks like for Aboriginal people because we're in remote circumstances and how we understand risk because we need to take them in and out of risk yeah. so they understand what it looks like and feels like and then the community understand what it looks like and feels like too. And it's very, very different how you go about doing that. And that's just one example. So how you deliver your mainstream skills is so, so different when it comes to working, and you guys know because you instinctually know, but for clinic, clinicians, they don't instinctually know, you know, so that's the stuff that I think where it needs to happen, but you're right, we need to be at the table all the time, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dennis. Um, we've got one lady there, and there's one lady here, and that's time out because we've gone over time, <laughs> you don't mind waiting. Yes, hi. It's wonderful to hear you um, and refreshing. My interest is uh, children in care yeah. and um, your, your, the optimism side of it is that you've spoken to them and, and could you just expand a little bit about what, what sort of a program you have talked to them or information you've given? Just some terminology so we can start from the up, bottom down to go up to them to start uh, generating the conversation. So you mean in terms of the uh, child protection? Yes. Stuff? Yeah. Um, so I guess the first thing is actually figuring out the predictors of cultural competency, there's 15 different dimensions that we know predict cultural competence. The cultural competency in child protection enables us to gauge that and then improve that. A big component of it though is, is empathy, which sounds really, which is no surprise to me, is that if you have empathy for Aboriginal people, walk a mile in their shoes is what people say. When someone experiences racism, you feel it. Um, you feel absolutely engaged with Aboriginal culture. Um, you understand people's world view that that is a big predictor of cultural competence just across the board, you know. How the policies are, uh, are optimism, how the policies of government and the yep. culture that they don't meet at no, the moment. So, in part of what information you've provided to the government so far, which you mentioned. Yep. What terminology, what some things we can say? I know it's cultural, but yep. the policies currently don't take in consideration culture. Yeah, so. yeah. I guess what we've done with child protection is we've actually looked at their, their policies and procedures and made them culturally specific. So an example would be um, when you do attachment um, intervention and when you assess attachment, it looks very, very different because we parent our kids very differently. So a lot of kids look like they've got bad attachment but it's just different parenting. So an example in the Kimberley, which is horrifying to me, that people are talking about, is kids are literally being removed, mostly from neglect still, as you know, and it's because people don't understand that kinship. So a kid looks like they're being neglected or roaming, but actually auntie for or uncle for is actually looking after them. And so the panic associated with, let's just remove them just in case, 
And then the next bit is there's, frankly, a dehumanising element that people don't believe that Aboriginal people care about their kids as much as non-Aboriginal people, so they don't feel the pain as much. So there's these combined things that basically means we need to get them in a room and make unconscious bias conscious and do so in a way that evokes behavioural change. But there's real science to this that's actually too much to get into here. But yeah, there's massive change in terms of the policy direction and how they understand it. Yeah, thank you for the question, that's great. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Theresa, last question. <laughs> is this one on? Yeah. Hi, I'm Teresa. I'm a Noongar woman I'm from the Bilberman Nation. What I do is I, I've designed an evidence-based research program in mental health and suicide prevention called um, Murich Cart. So that's for building strong minds. I'm based out in Armadale and I've been out there for 30-odd years working in, in this area. A lot of the people that I work with, most of the people that I've worked with, um, stolen generation mob you know, transgenerational trauma and all that sort of stuff, those attachments and detachment theories that you talk about. Working with the parents, now the grandparents yes. and the great-grandparents, you know, as somebody working on the ground and doing that evidence-based research oh. piloted program in Armidale, oh. the, I suppose the challenge for me is to secure the funding to keep delivering a successful program yeah. that's an evidence-based research program that also supports the cultural healing side of it and running the cultural healing activities and stuff, the same as what Dennis does yeah. in our communities and for it to stay community-led and community-driven yeah. and for people like myself, I've wanted to attend training like yours for a long, long time mm. but simply can't get the funding yeah. to attend and what I've heard here today is a lot of the stuff that I deliver on the ground, mm. it's there. Yeah, it is. And yeah. we do it naturally. It is. Yep. Um, we can't go to a university and be taught this. It's something that we do naturally. Absolutely. And to actually see it up on the board and put into a tool that can be taught to white fellas, it's like we still need our mob in there teaching it. Yeah. It can't agree. be taught by another white fella. Agree. It's got to be taught by the black fellas yeah, agree. for our black people. Yeah, I agree. And that's, it. That's, the, that's the cultural instinct stuff that you can't necessarily articulate. I found it hard to articulate it. Someone had to watch me do it and go, do you realise you do this, this? And I go, no, I didn't yeah. realise that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly Thank what you're you. talking about. Thank you so much. Rosalie, quickly. I can see her begging. Sorry. <laughs> we don't get opportunities like this to... Yes. We can't miss this deadly lady. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> I've known Tracy for 20 years. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, um, I greatly appreciate you coming here and I've rung you up plenty of time just to have a yarn with you yeah. on the phone and that. So it's been a tremendous... Uh, as I, I also specialise in mental health, been working at the grassroots, at the ground with our mob and just recently I've stepped out of clinical um, because of... Um, I've always felt that now as a mental... As a, um, for my own consulting, kick it consulting, and because I felt that clinical work working for our mob um, in regards to, fair enough, they do all that assessments and that, mm. it's got to come back to us as, as grassroots people and that, mm. who specialise in this field mm. and work it our way. Best practice, we talk about the best practice of our mob and that. Mm. And right. I've been delivering the mental health light trees, the mental health first aid training throughout. I just come back from Billaluna remote community um, and up in the queue uh, just last night I just come back in that so I understand we understand the remote community in that and it's so true and the effect it has upon our youth in that um, and it needs to be done and clinical needs to consult with us as Aboriginal people as Aboriginal specialist area and which I've just been with working with 15 clinical nurse specialists in that and the first thing that they do, always consult with us in that. And it's important yeah. to do that. But we have to do it, go step out and out and work with our mob our way. Best practice. Yeah, agree. Agree. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Thank you, thank you everyone, uh, for joining us this morning. And thank you, Tracy. Wow, what a um, lot of information there and a journey that Tracy is going to take us on further. Coming up next in the Discovery Lounge is a panel discussion presented in partnership with the ABC Perth, Fixing Truth. How do we do it and what is stopping us? With Jessica Strutt, Glyn Greensmith, Narelda Jacobs and Jeff Gallup. Make sure you're back here in five minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, Tracy Westerman.